Coming up on American Black Journal, reparations for African Americans is a topic we have been talking about for decades. My special panel of guests will give their perspectives on what is owed to the Black descendants of enslaved people and the survivors of discrimination. Plus, we'll talk about what to expect from Detroit's task force on reparations that voters approved in the last election. It's an important topic. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Reparations, what is owed to Black Americans? That's the question we recently tackled on a virtual town hall hosted by American Black Journal and Bridge Detroit. It was an emotional discussion that covered reparations for discriminatory housing and economic practices in Detroit and as a way to close the wealth gap between whites and Blacks. We also talked about what form reparations should take and who should receive them. Today, we're bringing you a portion of that town hall that features civil rights activist, Reverend Dr. Joanne Watson, Lauren Hood, who's chair of the Detroit Planning Commission, Keith Williams, who's chair of the Michigan Democratic Party's Black Caucus, and Andre Perry, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. So based on your research, and of course on your opinion, uh, tell us, why do African-Americans need reparations. And if we don't do that, what is the, the, the likelihood that we solve the inequality that we all live with? Well, our inability to pay the unpaid debt is still with us, that the racial wealth divide where we see white families median wealth eight times that of Black families is a direct result of the systemic uh, um, exclusion of assets or uh, of subsidies that we are owed, um, and this continues to this day. Um, in addition, the, the sort of framework, of you will, of denying um, African-Americans uh, public subsidies that, they, that other populations enjoy was taken up in, in, in different ways in um, more contemporary contexts. Um, so you have housing discrimination, you have criminal justice um, bias, um, you have uh, business discrimination. Um, all of these follow a certain path of, uh, of, of that, that, that uh, Black people were denied um, um, what they are due. And, and so um, there's a real cost um, that Black people still have to pay, a real penalty. You know, my research shows that homes in Black neighborhoods um, um, compared to areas where there are few black people in them are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Cumulatively, that's about 156 billion in lost equ equity in black neighborhoods. And, and, and this is particularly true in, in Detroit where, one, where so many black people used to own homes but could not hold on to them because of the, the, the housing crisis. And, and let me just bring this back to wealth. When you have less wealth, it's harder with, to withstand the economic shocks that inevitably occur. The, those who had wealth could survive the housing crisis better. Those who had wealth could survive the pandemic, can, um, can um, withstand uh, um, environmental hurdles. And so that lack of wealth 
um, really predicts for lower outcomes um, in every other area. So, you know, we, 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 this is an issue that has not gone away. People say, oh, I didn't own any slaves. Well, um, the impact of slavery, the impact of Jim Crow racism, the impact of housing discrimination is still with us. And by the way, we're not asking uh, uh, individuals to pay for pay reparations. We're asking the federal government, state governments, local municipalities to pay, and also institutions because um, we can't let them off the hook. So colleges and universities, universities churches. Um, and so I'm encouraged by, by what's happening all across the country with these local efforts, but um, we, um, hopefully they will move up to the national level. Yeah. So, so I want to talk about the practical end of this with you uh, as well, um, the form of reparations. So you just threw out a number, uh, $156 billion, that gap between uh, what uh, white families in America have been able to, to earn through property ownership and what, what African-Americans have been able to do. That's a, I mean, it's a huge number, um, but we throw huge numbers all the time yeah. <laughs> out with, with, with federal spending. But, but what is the way, what is the way to make up that gap? Is it through some sort of payment or is, is there a more creative uh, spectrum of things that we ought to be thinking about to, to make that number go away? Well, remember, reparations is, is mostly about the claims people can have around um, systemic oppression. So there are different types of claims made. So when you're talking about slavery and unpaid labor, you, you're talking about a check. When you're talking about housing discrimination, you're talking about down payment assistance and, and the like. Um, and, and, you know, so it really depends on the claim. You know, my colleague Rashawn Ray and I put out a report not that long ago um, where we outline a, a series of steps, including cash payments, um, but also including scholarships um, uh, to make college free. Uh, we also include um, a, a business grants um, because we know that businesses were denied opportunities. Uh, um, uh, we also in include other subsidies. So I, I think it's a, a range of approaches at, coming from multiple levels. Again, the you know when you're talking about housing discrimination, for instance, there was housing discrimination on the part of federal, state, and local uh, and ordinances. So uh, entities. So all of those institutions, all of those um, levels of government, have some responsibility to pay. So it's going to look different. And that 156 billion, it was only in uh, the case of housing devaluation. And, and I just wanna put this in perspective. In just that one area, 156 billion would have financed um, a more than 4 million black owned businesses based upon the average amount black people used to start their firms. It would have paid for 8 million four year degrees based upon the average amount of a four year public education. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan, 3,000 times over, covered nearly all of Hurricane C Katrina damage, and it's doubled the, the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. This is a big number. So when you're talking about reparations, which falls in anywhere in the area of uh, three to $17 billion, uh, trillion dollars, um, based upon the model you use, um, you could see a dramatic shift in how um, uh, Black people live. And, and again, I, I just want to emphasize this. Um, um, and I say this like it keeps my teeth white, that there's nothing wrong with Black people that ending racism can't solve. That, that when, when people talk about what's wrong with, with uh, uh, Black communities, they blame Black people. Tic Tac Han, the, the Vietnamese philosopher um, who recently died, once said, that if you are growing a head of lettuce and it's not growing, you don't blame the lettuce. You look to see if it's getting sunlight. You look to see if it's get the soils enriched, if it's getting rainwater. You don't blame the lettuce, but when it comes to black communities, we're constantly blaming the lettuce and not looking at the policies that, it, that still inflict harm and penalty on us. So for me, reparations is, is about healing, is a moral, the debt, as was mentioned, is a fiscal one. And, and, and this one more point um, that this idea that we can't handle a check is 
ridiculous. You know, um, just this past um, pandemic, you actually saw two, two things happen. When millennials um, uh, had their student loans frozen, guess what happened? We saw a small bump in um, home ownership. Um, and and the, the relief packages for um, um, had actually caused an uptick in black businesses, particularly micro businesses. And so black people used the, their uh, stimulus checks to start new businesses. Why wouldn't they start more businesses with more money? I, I mean, the evidence is pretty clear that when given an opportunity, we take it. Reverend Watson, it's always good to see you, but it's especially good to see you today uh, for this conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me on this very important topic. I've been involved on the reparations issue since my youth. Uh, I was absolutely mentored by some of the greatest uh, reparations freedom fighters, uh, Mario Bedelli, then known as Richard Henry, uh, Reverend Milton Henry Gaidio Bedelli. Re reparations Ray Jenkins got his title from me uh, when he would call into my radio show talking about reparations every day. Uh, many of our own people don't know that uh, the Confederates who lost the Civil War, uh, they received reparations. Many, many populations have received reparations, uh, but not Africans who helped build this country. And the whole country benefited from the unpaid labor of African people who were kidnapped. And I, I, I prefer to say people were enslaved and not say slaves, and not refer to those who thought they owned slaves. They were not masters, they were enslavers. America will never be fully healed from, from this original sin of enslavement and until reparations is, that is rightfully due is afforded to the Africans who helped build this country. It's not a handout, it's a dead old. It's not a handout, it's a dead old. And the, that, that has been recognized as a recognized legal principle that has been applied to every other group of people that has been wronged, except of African descent. Let's talk about what Detroiters approved last year and what the status is of this task force. What will we see in the coming months? Well, Stephen, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> it always <laughs> is. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about this group of us that meets. So there's myself, cousin Keith over here, um, Council President Sheffield and her people. Um, you know, uh, we had Jamon Jordan in the conversation earlier for the historical lens. There's some other grassroots activists that have been coming to the conversation. So we're kind of a de facto steering committee. And like you said, have been engaged since November. So we as a group are trying to make the most um, authentic and inclusive process possible, but there's always a tension with getting something done and being inclusive. Because the longer it takes to do something, the more inclusive you can be. But then we're also um, contending with, you know, this pressure from folks to, like, see something happening. Um, it's always my contention, like, the, the subject of reparations, like, this is sacred work. We're overturning, you know, generations of trauma here. Like, this is something that's going to take a lot of time to get it right. But folks are like, where's my check? So there's this tension of, of those two things. And I think what, what our group is trying to consider is what can we do now? You know, we need some direct service because there are people struggling now, but also create a long enough runway where we can get this right. Because this, this is sacred work. It's, there's a lot tied up in here. It's not just like a wealth gap. It's like a hope gap, a worthiness gap, a self-respect gap. There's a lot tied into to what reparations can and should do. Uh, Keith, uh, the Black Caucus commissioned a poll that showed majority of Detroiters support reparations for past discriminatory, discriminatory housing policies and practices here in the city. Uh, talk about those feelings and what you feel those reparations could look like. All of us remember I think uh, the, the, the struggle that African-Americans had to own homes in, in many places here in Detroit. Uh, I think a lot of people know about the struggles that we have right now keeping homes in the city of Detroit. Um, tell us about what Detroiters think about what we should do about all that. 
you know, when we got involved in this, uh, I, I got involved because of Robin Ruth Simmons. I was looking at Channel 7 one night and she was on and she was talking about this little town in Everstill, Illinois. I was so impressed after the show, my wife was saying, I said, I'm getting ready to call this young lady. So I inboxed her and she called me back. And so I was inspired by, she took a little city of 75,000 folks, 80% African-American and created this new economic engine. And so I said, if she can do it here, then why can't we do it in Detroit? And then, so I got involved, then to, to, to delve off into this, you gotta know the history of Detroit. Like you said in your opening, from slavery, then 19, uh, 1900, there were 6,000 Blacks. Then you go to 1931. That's when the influx of Blacks came from the South and then to come to work for a Fort Motor Company. Then they had to have a place to stay and they moved us over there, Black black Bottom and things like that. And so I got to see, and so I, started, I got to think about how much wealth was stolen from us, okay? And so if you look at it, the Black Bottom, and then this 375 movement, then 1941 on Burwood Street, how they used federal dollars under the auspices of urban development, as well as they did Black Bottom. We couldn't have, we didn't have a place to stay. And they did it with ordinances, restricted covenances, and, um, and, and using the words slums, so they can use it as uh, urban development money. And then I got more deep, deep into it than I realized up until 1971, Black folks could not live in Rosedale Park because of restrictive covenances. And so I look at it like this. I don't look at it as a cash handout. I look at it as a re redevelopment of the city and African-Americans leading the charge on it, such as housing. Housing is where all the wealth was lost. And so, uh, like Lauren said, this is sacred stuff. I cried. I cried when I got involved in this. And when we did that poll, I knew when we did that ballot and this, you know, this is the first in the, in the in, of this kind in the country. I just came from December 12th. I was at a reparations convention sponsored by Robin Ruth Simmons in Everstill, Illinois. It was 40 cities. Detroit is the true chocolate city. San Francisco, LA, they got black folks, but nothing like Detroit. And so I said, if Detroit can be the lead dog in this initiative, if we just come together, like Lauren said, we're going through some family issues right now, and we're going to get through it, you know, when you get us all together as a family, but it's all about love. But now our language, language says the city council got to set the task for us up to make recommendations on economic development and housing. Yeah. Yeah. So Lauren, uh, we've got a question from Kelly on, uh, on Facebook, and I want to put it to you. She says, why do you think there's so much resistance to reparation? I think that's an interesting question to talk about the things that we are uncomfortable talking about, right? Uh, that, that it when depends race... on, yeah, which, which group are we talking resistance from? I think Black folks resist it because we have a lot of pride for mm -hmm. what we've been able to accomplish. And again, like Mama Watson said, and we all say it's not a, it's not a handout. It's, you know, for, for work served. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of pride on the part of Black folks. I think that other groups, I would just say anti-Black racism. Like in your opening segment, you talked about the other ethnic groups that, you know, were compensated for their, their pain and trauma and time served. And I think if you, you know, apples to apples, harm done, compensation. What the, what's the differing factor in those groups and us other than, you know, our, our color? I really think it's specific anti-black racism that people don't don't want us to have anything. No, I, I think there's also uh, there's a dimension of this that differs from other some of these other groups, right? After the Holocaust took place uh, during World War II, uh, uh, the Germans were sorry for what they did, and they were made to be sorry by an international community. Uh, but there, there was there was a feeling that they did owe something uh, to the Jews who were who were victims. Uh, after uh, Japanese were interred here in um, in um, in this country during the during the war, eventually there was a, an apologetic um, imperative to try to make that better. I, I I don't think that 
has happened quite yet uh, with African Americans. It certainly didn't happen after the Civil War. Uh, no. There was a backlash that 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 was angry that African Americans were free and wanted to compete for all the resources that everybody else did. You move up through Jim Crow, uh, the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, Today, we're fighting about uh, the language that the president of the United States is using to describe his next Supreme Court nominee, who would be the first African-American woman uh, to sit on that court. I think that's part of what is missing. There, uh, there is not uh, an imperative to be sorry. That's correct. But what is at the root of that? <laughs> oh, right. it, yes. You know, why, 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 why is that? I think also... There, there needs to be some education around what our contributions were, like even for black folks. Um, everything I know about black history, I learned starting at the age of maybe 35, you know, through my own um, research. So what does it look like when we have a comprehensive understanding of what our contributions actually were? So, you know, we were doing a reparations program at the Charles H. Wright. And one of the participants had his grandfather show up, who was an actual sharecropper. So he walked us through his day as a sharecropper. After his testimony, we all understood why we were worthy of this compensation. But everybody doesn't have access to stories like that. But what if everybody did? I just think that the money should go into housing so people can have, lay their head and build some wealth. And then we need an economic engine you know, with all this new creativity out here, these kids are entrepreneurs, they should be able to, uh, they should be able to be, go out there and, and produce a product and, and sell their product to make money off of it. Uh, you know, this is not about a handout. Uh, this is about a hand up. And we're not asking for somebody to do something for us. And then you got some African Americans going through that psychological problem. They don't want no, they don't want to be under uh, the auspice of thinking that somebody gave them something. But guess up, guess what? It would take us 233 years to catch up with white America and their wealth. And so somehow we got to close this gap. And why not in Detroit? Why not in Washington, D.C., where we know I grew up in Detroit. I was born and raised. Um, in, in Black Bottom. I was born in Women's Hospital. The street, East uh, uh, East 4th Street is still there. It's old King's Football, it's King's Football Field where we live. And so I came from that. We moved from there to Northwest Detroit in 1957. So I get it. But, you know, currently we got this, this tax problem on the 600,000 of the, 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 the assessment part of it. And we need to do something about that. So it's a it's like a smorgasbord of things, but I think housing and, and economic development should drive this agenda. A lot of folks had their hand in causing the pain and the harm in African Americans. All I want to see is black folks get repaid and we get our dignity back and we can have a, a brighter future for all our kids. I'm I'm 66 now and I went to the whole shot of city. Detroit. I just want to see a vision of a hope. And like and my acronym for hope is this, helping, helping our people elevate. I want to see people elevate to a new standard of living and where they can prosper and they can enjoy the American dream. And you can see this entire hour-long town hall on reparations on the American Black Journal Facebook page. That's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Take care, and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.